Hello, Dr. Jankov. Thank you for being here and thank you for finding time for us. Let's start our interview. Um, could you evaluate Ukrainian economy state for now? Um, well, it's very difficult uh, in terms of uh, economic growth. Last year there was basically uh, no growth or actually a significant decline. Um, this year, in my view, it would be basically no growth either, around zero. Um, better than last year, but still the hoped for growth I don't think is going to materialize this year. Uh, partly because some of the reforms that were promised did not happen. And I hope that for next year, 2017, we can see some small growth. But generally, we are not in the blue. It's still going to be difficult. You're saying some reforms haven't been implemented. What are those reforms? I think there are many reforms that have not been implemented yet by this uh, government. I would, uh, I would highlight two, uh, two types of reform. One is the restructuring of the very large uh, government enterprise sector, state-owned enterprises that, uh, that are still in many sectors heavily subsidized. They drain money from the government budget. They are inefficient, corrupt. Um, and in all of the transition economies that have had successful reform, very early on in the, in the reform process, they were sold off to new owners, so the government doesn't have to deal with them. So that's one reform that hasn't happened at all. And the second reform that brings e an economy quickly up, this is uh, in heavy investment in basic infrastructure, in uh, roads, uh, ports, airports, urban infrastructure, meaning in water and sanitation system, solid waste systems, which in transport system, that people quickly see that something positive is happening and you need in difficult times um, of reform you need the people to see the citizens to see that something positive is uh, happening they have better uh, buses for example their water is cleaner uh, and i don't see this happening in uh, ukraine now yet the money is available and this is an interesting point why do you think it's not happening because someone is against of it and someone just uh, putting a pressure on it um, so I think the reform of the state enterprise is not happening because politicians are very afraid, both in the government and in uh, parliament. Um, there are different excuses like there is not going to be good prices. Well, how do you know that it's not going to be good prices uh, if, uh, if you don't try? I think uh, more surprisingly to me, the investment in public infrastructure is not happening um, where money is available from the World Bank, from the European Bank, uh, from, from other um, investors. Uh, the money I know is already committed by the European Union because of corruption and corruption in particular ministries like the Ministry of Regional Development, Regional Infrastructure, responsible for, uh, for this. But that part I don't understand because in all of the transition economies early on there was corruption, but infrastructure projects were nevertheless done because politicians, even if they're not economists, they understand that if you invest 3-4 billion euro in infrastructure, the economy is going to, uh, to go up significantly. So if a particular ministry or part of the government administration is corrupt, you take these projects to the prime minister's level to the president's level and you make sure it happens. You worked in uh, Bulgaria, of course, and uh, you reformed the country. You worked in Georgia and also you worked in Russia. Um, do any of these countries resemble what's going on in Ukraine with reforms or is not going on? Uh, well, initially all of these countries uh, uh, did, uh, did resemble uh, Ukraine. Uh, my own country, Bulgaria, for example, did not start reforming until about a decade into the transition period. So uh, communism fell in Bulgaria in 1989, but it was only in about 10, 10 years later, 1998-1999, that the reforms uh, started, uh, started happening. So we lost a full decade. But once reforms started happening, we simultaneously did tax reform, something that you're discussing a lot, uh, the reform of the state-owned uh, sector, so a big privatization wave uh, happened in a bit less than, uh, than uh, a year, and above all, very heavy investment in infrastructure. So uh, between about 1999 and uh, 2005, a period of five, six years, 
Every year, we essentially doubled investments in infrastructure, year after year after year. And I think this is important because people naturally in every country get tired from reforms. They want to see how their personal life is improved. So you cannot just tell them we're improving pensions, health care and so on. They want to see something um, visible to them. And that's, as I said, mostly they see that uh, that uh, the buses are cleaner and uh, newer, that their water is, uh, is uh, cleaner, so they don't have to worry about diseases and so on. They need to see something very practical, not just some big economic reforms. And how do those countries, how do they get the money to implement reforms? Um, mostly from uh, institutions like the World Bank, the European uh, Bank, that have large infrastructure projects, a lot of experience in our, in our uh, region. At this stage, um, interest rates uh, actually very low uh, in, uh, in the world, so Ukraine actually can benefit from, um, from investments and money that are virtually free in the sense that uh, you don't actually pay significant, if anything, interest rates. So this is a very good time to invest in this um, basic infrastructure that first directly goes into higher economic growth. Uh, but secondly, as I mentioned, it is seen. So within literally months, you can see better public services. And the population says, aha, uh -huh, this government is more serious about me, about improving my life and not just uh, some uh, reforms that don't directly uh, relate to me. Could you name a couple of reforms in Ukraine that you see as visible? I think there has been a lot of discussion on tax reform both that some of it has happened and that it's not radical enough. It's still a step. Um, the reform that was uh, proposed by the finance minister to me is a positive step. It always can be done better, but at least they tried and something positive, uh, positive happened. Uh, some of the reforms in the energy uh, sector, painful at first with increased gas prices, but necessary. Uh, but necessary to uh, remove the high corruption in, uh, in the energy sector. But there are, of course, many reforms that we don't see. Some of them are difficult, um, like the reform of the state-owned enterprises. Uh, and we see that uh, the biggest reformer in that regard, the Minister of Economy, basically got too tired um, fighting. But as I mentioned, there are also some relatively easy reforms that actually give you political capital, so they increase your popularity, like investment in social infrastructure. And I really do not understand why either the Prime Minister or the, Prime, or the President is not focused, uh, focused on this. They would get more popular if this actually starts going. Do you think that Ukraine owes too much money for uh, world institutions like World Bank, for example, or any other um, creditors, that, that's how we call them? Um, this has been a discussion here and uh, your finance minister has discussed this topic uh, last year uh, with some of the creditors that there is a very large debt burden and some of it should be forgiven. I agree with uh, Minister Yaresko that, uh, that both the large institutions, the European Union, the United States should help Ukraine in this uh, difficult um, period to forgive some of the debt. It has happened in other countries, so there is a lot of... Did it happen to Bulgaria? It did happen to uh, Bulgaria precisely in the period um, uh, in the late 1990s when uh, Bulgaria had actually a very similar debt burden to what Ukraine has now, about 100% of uh, gross domestic product was uh, our public debt about half of it was uh, forgiven. So there was about uh, a year of negotiations, but in the end, about half of it was forgiven. And that greatly helped uh, help the economy. I think it should also happen in the case of Ukraine. But the difference between Bulgaria and uh, Ukraine, at least so far, is that in that one year when we were negotiating the forgiveness of part of our debt, we managed to do tax reform, we managed to sell a lot of our state-owned enterprises through a privatization process, and we managed to do a lot of infrastructure projects. So when, you, when we went to foreign uh, investors, we saw, see, we're doing everything that we can, so now it's your turn. The difference so far, at least with Ukraine, is that if your government, I imagine, goes and says, forgive our debt, the creators say, well, you first do your part, otherwise why would I do mine? 
Do you think that creditors and investors still believe that Ukraine is reformable enough? I think they still do. Uh, they uh, perhaps the Ukrainian citizens follow every day what's happening and get more frustrated when some of the changes do not happen. Uh, foreign creditors, analysts uh, probably look just from time to time uh, to what's happened in Ukraine. So their patience is, in other words, uh, a bit larger at this um, at this stage. Uh, but they do see more political uncertainty lately. They do see the absence of uh, reform in the state-owned enterprises and some problems in the energy sector. But they still have hope. If you were an investor, would you invest in Ukraine right now? If so, what would be your demands? Um, I would wait, um, not invest right now. Um, among the reforms that we already mentioned, uh, there is also another issue that is bothering investors and I'm sure citizens as well, which is the instability of the currency. So devaluation, significant devaluation has taken place. So if you're an investor, you worry when you enter the country and if your business depends on uh, on the local currency, uh, then you may uh, want to wait. This was incidentally an issue in other countries, in Estonia in the early 90s, in Slovakia in the late 90s, in Bulgaria, when I mentioned, and there is a solution to that, which is to introduce a so-called currency board. Uh, I don't know whether there is much discussion uh, in Ukraine on the currency of board. Currency board basically says we don't believe that our central bank is independent enough, is uh, expert enough to keep uh, a good level of our currency. So we will tie it to a different to a different currency, for example, the euro. And we would say from tomorrow on, um, the Ukraine uh, the Ukrainian hryvnia will be let's say 25 hryvnia to the euro, and it will be set in a law, and it will always like be like that for a period of time. So we don't have any more monetary policy. We just give it to 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 Europe. What this does is that if I'm an investor, I automatically know that inflation here will be the same as inflation in Germany, roughly speaking. Uh, and then I'm a lot uh, a lot more at ease to to invest. I know devaluation is not going to happen after that. But this is a beneficial point. What is the uh, the worst point of this uh, of this idea? Well, first, a number of countries have done it. So again, there is a small benefit to being a late reformer, like Georgia was ten years ago, and uh, like uh, Ukraine is now. That you can look around the region and say, if a new idea comes, is it is it crazy? So. Is it like something that we came up with? Well, currency boards were introduced in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Slovakia, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Slovenia. So there is a number of countries that have done this. You can, you can see what they've done. The positive part is that, um, that as I mentioned, there is no inflation. Inflation immediately goes to zero or, or very, very small. Foreign investors start coming, so so foreign direct investment very rapidly increases. Um, there is a negative, potentially negative part of this. If uh, if uh, Parliament is uh, let's say not very um, clear on whether how long you need to to keep this, and suddenly decides within a year or two years that this is not a good idea, let's go back to the previous. Uh, to the previous uh, arrangement, uh, and if there are signals from parliamentarians or from the governments that this is uncertain, it doesn't actually have any of the positives. On the contrary, you've managed to kill um, inflation, but the uncertainty also kills future economic growth. So you have to be very committed to it, and once you implement it, it has to be very clear that it stays for a long period. You were one of the co-founders of Doing Business Rating. Um, just for us to know, um, how did it happen that you created that, that thing? Um, it's happened nearly 15 years ago. I was already working at the World Bank for a few years and I had worked in a lot of former communist countries, uh, in, um, starting with Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, uh, Georgia and so on. And it started uh, occurring to me that uh, when you do significant reforms um, in tax, in um, uh, in pension reform, healthcare reform, and so on, many of these reforms are actually not immediately obvious, or maybe they're never obvious to a large part of the population. They don't see their benefits uh, quickly. And But if you want to do them, you need to show some reforms where the benefit is almost immediate. They can understand it. So we started with the simplest of all, 
how to start a new business. Many people think of starting a business in any country uh, and many actually in the end do start a business. Uh, so what we thought is let's make the process of starting a business as easy as possible in many countries in the world and show it, start talking about these uh, reforms to politicians. They, all politicians understand that it's better to have more businesses than uh, not. So they started getting excited about this and then we thought we can create a product doing business which teaches you how to do reforms, but very simple reforms that make everyday life of small businesses easy. And that's how it started. In Ukraine in 2015 um, have taken 87th place among other uh, post-Soviet Union countries, uh, which, for example, are Russian Federation, 62nd place in 2015, Belarus, 57th, and Georgia, 15th. In 2016, Ukraine increased its place by four points, so now it's 83rd. Um, could, you, could you try to explain us why Ukraine is so far away from most of uh, post-Soviet Union countries? Uh, well, there is one, as I mentioned, a lot about uh, what doing business is. It's about making it easier for basically new enterprises, new entrepreneurs to start businesses and develop their businesses. Ukraine has a much bigger issue than many of the countries that, uh, that you mentioned, and certainly most European countries, is that there exist a few large oligarchs, uh, which is not the case in most other countries, that prevent actively new businesses from entering their sectors because they want to, to have larger profits in their sectors. So it's not only the government here that's inefficient in helping businesses, which is usually the case in most countries, uh, but it's also that in Ukraine you have the, the double negative of a relatively inefficient and corrupt government and very large and very powerful oligarchs that actively prevent uh, initiatives to make the life of other businesses uh, uh, businesses easier. And in that regard, there is a paradox. I get often asked why, let's say, a country like Belarus or a country like Kazakhstan actually is reforming on doing business, given that, generally speaking, uh, these are not very democratic countries. And the answer to that is, yes, they have some issues with, uh, with democracy, but nevertheless, the government uh, wants some business activity, some economic growth, and they are not powerful oligarchy groups that prevent that from happening. So if the government in Belarus decides we want to reform, they actually do it. Well, in the case of Ukraine, as I mentioned, we have to deal both with better efficiency in the government, but also reducing significantly the power of oligarchs. Did uh, uh, the fact that we applied uh, the agreement uh, of association with the European Union, uh, did this have any effect on the doing business ranking for Ukraine? It should over time, not yet, because this is relatively recent, but, uh, but European part of the laws that Ukraine has to adopt to become a full member of the European uh, Union actually uh, affect doing business rankings in the sense that, uh, let's say, in the this commercial dispute resolution in the courts, which is one uh, one of the indicators in doing business, or in investor rights, investor protection, part of what uh, Ukraine has to go through in essentially making Ukrainian laws similar uh, to European laws, it would have to adopt laws that are more investor friendly, that give more opportunity for quick and efficient uh, resolution in, in the courts. For everyday business for for the average business person. So yes, it will have an effect, but hopefully it will be seen in the next one or two years. Uh, could you try to um, evaluate benefits and negatives from signing the association agreement with the European Union for Ukraine? And maybe there are some examples that you can mention, for example, for Bulgaria or Georgia. Well, the biggest benefit uh, that we've seen in all of the first the Central European countries like uh, Slovakia, the Czech Republic that joined in 2004, then Bulgaria and Romania that joined in 2007, Croatia most recently that joined uh, two years ago, is that a lot of the major reforms in the country that are difficult reforms do not only depend on your political class, which as I mentioned may be more inefficient uh, and uh, and perhaps more corrupt than you'd like to be, 
but also depend on Brussels. So there is a lot of, um, uh, of discussions and coordinations with the European Commission, uh, especially on how to do this type of reforms, uh, healthcare reform, education uh, reform, pension reform. And in that regard, even if local politicians are not too excited to do these reforms because they're difficult um, to do, essentially they're helped by being part of the European um, Union. We've also seen in countries that have um, uh, acceded to the European Union that have joined that with some difficulty, but corruption levels generally start going down. Like in Poland? Like in Poland, even like my own country, Bulgaria, it was a highly corrupt country before entering the European Union. There is still some corruption, but it's certainly a lot less than it was in 2007 before we, uh, we uh, joined. And that's because suddenly you're subject to the rules of the European Union that, uh, for example, on public procurement of large projects, you cannot simply essentially organize it uh, in a way that your friends or some oligarch wins all the projects. The European Union also is watching for this. So, so I think the big benefit is also corruption is uh, rapidly reduced. Uh, talking about European Union, I'm sure you follow in the global news and uh, the Brexit talks, the, the talks that the, uh, Great Britain can actually leave the European Union. And what would happen to the European Union economy if Great Britain actually leaves? Uh, as you know, I'm currently based in London at the London School of Economics, so we do a lot of uh, studies on this, uh, on this possible effect. Um, uh, in short, it would be bad both for the British economy and for the European uh, economy. Britain is uh, one of the largest uh, economies, currently the third largest uh, economy within the European Union. So a possible Brexit makes uh, the whole European economy, um, European economy weaker, not just because of the possibility of Britain leaving, but because if one country leaves, then it opens the door for other countries saying, well, we also want to renegotiate. So I think this is the main danger that if you have a contract and suddenly one part of the contract says, well, I don't like it, I want something else, you know, Poland can renegotiate, Spain can renegotiate, it becomes kind of a, a new and open process. I think this is why currently the pound uh, sterling is, uh, is falling. But so is the euro, actually. So, so both currencies are being hit relative to the US, um, US dollar. We have uh, about four months, more or less, between now and the referendum. So I think they are going to be very uncertain months. And in that regard, uh, Britain's politics is showing something that you are very familiar here in uh, Ukraine, that the government itself is not on the one side. You have about half of the government actually um, going for Brexit and saying that it's good for Britain and the other half, including uh, the Prime Minister Cameron, saying that it's bad for Britain. So <laughs> politics are divided even at, uh, at the government level in Britain, which doesn't happen often. Let's go for another exit, which is Grexit. Um, we've, we've been following that for, uh, for several years now. Uh, do you see that Grexit would happen in 2016? Uh, if not, why? If, if yes, also why? Grexit, uh, it's, it's much more realistic to expect at some point Grexit than, uh, than Brexit. I don't think personally that uh, Brexit will, uh, will happen. Simply, British business is by now too dependent on the European uh, uh, market and we already see it in the currency exchange, as you, as you mentioned. The Greek economy, on the other hand, uh, doesn't have much of an influence on the European economy. So if Greece were to leave tomorrow, basically nothing is going to happen to either the euro or the rest of the European um, Union. So, um, so there is not such a big implication for Europe as a whole. But I still don't think Brexit will, um, will happen because, again, it opens the door for other countries. Once one country leaves, and I've had many discussions when I was uh, finance minister with other finance ministers, including the German finance minister, Minister Schäuble, who is still uh, one of the opponents of Grexit and his view has always been if one country leaves it opens the door for other countries and then the union becomes much much weaker union. So in short I don't think that either Brexit is going to happen or Grexit is going to, um, uh, to happen but one is much more important than the other the possible Brexit and this is why all European politicians are also you would see in the next three to four months going to lobby hard against it. 
Uh, can we talk now more about sanctions against the uh, Russian Federation and also uh, how hard it is for a European Union economy to maintain sanctions? It's quite difficult in some economies to maintain these sanctions, which is why you hear uh, some voices saying it's now time to not to eliminate sanctions, but to reduce them uh, somehow. Uh, there are economies, uh, including Bulgaria's uh, economy, that, for example, in the agricultural sector, depended very much on the Russian market. And during sanctions, suddenly you see the largest agricultural market for Bulgarian exports just disappear, and it has disappeared very, very quickly. So there are some of the Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, that depended a lot on the uh, Russian uh, market. In Germany, there are some sectors like car producers that depend, uh, Russians used to buy a lot of luxury uh, cars, um, as, you, uh, as you know. The Italian fashion um, market just enumerating some. So there are quite a few countries uh, that depend on uh, Russia being a major consumer. They are clearly hurt. So far the European Union has managed to maintain its, um, its one voice on this uh, issue of remaining uh, sanctions and I think it will continue for some uh, time to be, uh, uh, to be uh, the case. But, and I think this is an issue for Ukrainian politicians, while last year and the year before, Ukraine probably was the number one um, international issue for the European Union. Outside of what was happening inside, the next big topic was Ukraine. This year it's not. This year there are the issues that have come up. Brexit is probably number one. Migration from the Middle East uh, and North Africa is number two. The absence of reforms in Ukraine and this general, I would say, ineptitude of the government not being able to portray um, change has contributed to the fact that somehow European politicians no longer think of Ukraine as much as they used to in the past. And I think this gives a dangerous signal that, well, we did everything that we could on sanctions and otherwise helping uh, the Ukrainian government. It's not doing enough, so why should we continue hurting our sector? So you see in the last one or two months, you see German industry, Italian industry, French industry, um, for the first time Dutch industry in the Netherlands, starting to say we should uh, somehow reduce sanctions. Do you personally accept this uh, position? Uh, I think that it's not yet time. So they and we in Bulgaria, while well, we suffer, we've stayed on this uh, on this uh, view uh, until now that uh, we still need to keep the sanctions for some time until it's very clear that Russia doesn't have the same attitude as it has had in the uh, in the past. But patience is running very, very short uh, because the same people who um, support the sanctions previously were motivating this with. There is a radically new government, radically new political situation in Ukraine that brings it closer to Europe. Well, we don't really see this. It's not quite happening. Um, you are very familiar with the Russian economy as you work there and you still follow it. Um, we are here in Ukraine usually uh, full of Russian economy as well because we think, you know, it's a neighboring country and this is an aggressor. So we think it should be, uh, their economy doesn't have to work well. So here's the question that we usually ask all our experts, uh, geopolitical, economical, whatever. So is Russian economy um, being hit right now very hard or it still can maintain itself? The Russian economy is, is, is hurting, so it's hit very hard and it's obvious both in last year when basically the economy declined by about 4% and then this year when the initial forecasts were for the economy to grow by about 2 percentage points and now even the official forecast by the central bank, the Russian Ministry of Finance, suggests that the economy again is going to be shrinking by maybe 1-2% but it's continuing to decline. Uh, which shows that there are very significant uh, uh, issues uh, there and in the meantime the sanctions on the financial sector are hurting the future investment. So not only growth is low now, but actually it's going to be low for the next few uh, years. Um, so last week actually the Russian Ministry of uh, Finance came up with a very interesting report showing the likely scenario between now and 15 years from now to 2030, the year 2030, basically suggesting that if they don't have on their own significant reforms in pensions, in public finance, in taxes, 
essentially the economy is not going to grow for 15 years. So this is the first official report that says, look, we can pretend that things are going fine, but actually they are, they are not. And in that regard, uh, Russia also needs to do some very radical uh, reforms, which this government does not want to do and probably is not going to do. Um, what is going on with ruble? Well, it's developed very significantly. Uh, it was felt that uh, this year it's developed so much that it wouldn't continue, but actually even this year it's continued to uh, develop. And the main reason is that uh, the budget, the national budget, is running a very large deficit and it is uh, covering this deficit by using the National Reserve Fund. And if they continue using the National Reserve Fund at the rate that they have been doing over the last few months, essentially by October of this year, so within six or seven months, it's going to be all gone. So they're not going to have uh, reserves. Sanctions prevent them, prevent Russia from raising money in the US and uh, in Europe. So the only possibility is somehow to raise money in Asia, in China and so on. But this typically takes a long time. So we can be in a situation where by the end of 2016, the Russian government has completely run out of um, out of money, even to pay salaries and pensions and so on. And this is why the ruble continues to develop. Which uh, investors um, have fled the uh, the Russian economy and which have stayed? If you if you know, could you please share that information? Financial investors, or investors that invested in the stock market, that invested in financial services, have nearly all fled. Have less have left in the last year, year and uh, and a half. Investors that have invested in consumer consumer industries, consumer uh, products, um, starting with basic things like toothpaste, um, shampoos, um, television production. This type of investors, iPhone production and so on and sale. They have also left because while the economy has gone down by four or five percent last year, consumer spending has gone down by 15 to 20 percent. People are not spending as much as they used to do before. So the consumer sectors are hurting as well. So the only investors that have le are still remaining in Russia, that are still there, are investors in the extractive industries, in forestry, diamond, diamonds, uh, metals, um, this type of uh, products where initial investment is very large, they are waiting for the sections at some point in time to be lifted and they're going to stay there. Um, coming back to Ukraine, um, we talked before the program about uh, Georgians and Ukrainian government. So could you evaluate Georgian efforts in reforming Ukraine? Um, first, I should say that I'm quite familiar with the Georgian reformers who worked with President, then President Saakashvili from 2004 to 2013, nearly 10 years. Uh, and uh, Georgia is probably the example of a country that starts reforming late uh, and does quite a lot in a short period of time. Between 2005 and about 2007, for three years, they did nearly all the reforms that uh, they've become famous uh, for. Now part of that team is uh, here, in some in the ministry, some in the public administration, some like former President Saakashvili as governor of uh, the Odessa uh, region. They are trying and participating in some of the reform um, efforts. I think there is a lot that Ukraine can learn from, um, from uh, them. But I think also what they are learning in Ukraine is that it's not as easy as in Georgia, because again, in Georgia it wasn't just that there were reformers in the government, is that uh, Saakashvili's party had a full majority in parliament and they could basically implement any reforms, legal reforms that they wanted to. While here we see in Kiev many situations where the government proposes a reform and it doesn't pass parliament or it's radically changed. So I think even people like former President Saakashvili would find it more difficult to work here. Um, do you think, do you think that um, experts in government is, is a fine situation or it's abnormal and we should leave this only for Ukrainians in government? I think it's a relatively, uh, let's say, innovative approach, so not many countries have, uh, have done it, but there are instances around the world, especially in the richer countries, more developed countries, where, where uh, expats work in the, the government and do very well. We were talking previously about um, 
Brexit. Uh, uh, Britain, well, the central bank governor of Britain is actually Canadian, and he did such a good job in Canada that uh, he was invited to run um, Britain's uh, central bank. So there are the examples like this in Europe, certainly there are a number of, um, of examples actually. In the current French government, there are three Spanish, uh, Spanish ministers, Spanish-born and uh, educated and so on. So there are examples um, uh, around. I think, again, Ukraine has been so slow in transition and so late in the transition process that it can benefit not just from Georgians, but from Estonians, Slovaks. Um, uh, this cannot last for very long. It can last for some early years while the administration is changing. Uh, Ukraine has enough talented people, so you don't need to perpetuate this. But for the first one, two years, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good idea. And if we are uh, finalizing, let's talk about Ukraine a little bit. What do you find uh, the most attractive for you about Ukraine? Uh, it's a large market with uh, fairly good basic education. So there are a lot of well-educated uh, people. It's not an issue that you need to bring experts from uh, outside, at least not for very long. So you, can, uh, you have the base for a rich, prosperous, uh, well-functioning country. Uh, and it really can happen. We've seen other countries in difficult situations like Ukraine turn it, uh, turn it uh, around. Just a question of changing government and politics. Thank you very much, Mr. Dankov, uh, Dr. Dankov, actually. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Hope to see you any other time. Thank you very much.